Okay, it's freezing outside and pretty darn stormy. I figured this would be a good time to convert the bed into the um, couch mode with a little table, and we're gonna make a video. Okay, the next thing I want to do is get some heat going here. Because we're on shore power, I'm going to use our electric heater. 1500 watts in this little package has different settings, does a good job. Now that I have the heater, couch, and table set up, we can get started. We're going to look at planning trips, choosing routes. We're going to look at some apps and also cover some basics on uh, map and compass use. Planning the trip hopefully is something that's fun and it's also a way to avoid disappointment. We plan some trips well in advance. Um, they take an intense amount of planning and other trips, not so much. The two major factors are the destination and the duration of the trip. That's going to dictate um, what kind of uh, clothing we bring, you know, what kind of items that we want to bring that we don't typically carry. The season will be a factor as to uh, what type of clothing that we bring. Uh, but typically we just keep uh, two bags, his and hers. We keep those loaded up and ready to go. A huge benefit of having this trailer is keeping it packed and ready to roll. We store some sealed non-perishable food in this trailer year-round, but we prefer to do our shopping locally during our travels. This way we always have backup food and we also support uh, small businesses in the uh, local areas that we visit. If you want to see more about how we pack food and groceries, there's a separate video you know, on this channel. With long durations, we also need to consider the impact at home. We have animals, we garden, we need to consider the perishable food and uh, the mail. The two ways we look at duration, how many days do we have to take this trip? Or if we want to visit X, Y, and Z, how many days will it take to pull off that type of a trip? We've learned that it's critical to be realistic with the driving time. For uh, road trips or trips with multiple destinations or an overlanding type trip, we like to limit our driving time to about um, six to eight hours per day. But we may drive a 12 hour day if we need to do that in order to pull off the trip. The actual distance that we travel during that time is gonna be dependent on the route that we take. Some of our trips have specific destinations in mind. Others are dictated maybe by the weather, uh, where there's smoke. Trips to popular locations like Yellowstone, the Redwoods, uh, the coast of California, uh, they may require reservations to be made a year in advance. Personally, uh, we avoid uh, single destination trips. It's just too much of a risk to uh, book a campsite at a place like Yellowstone for maybe five days and then get there and find out you're surrounded by you know, screaming families or um, smoke from Not nearby bad, forest yeah. fires or bear problems. So we typically avoid long-term camping at a single destination. In fact, we rarely make reservations in advance. We may uh, make a phone call to find out if there's a site available during a particular trip, but it's just not something that we normally do. Uh, we often avoid campgrounds altogether, but sometimes that's what you need to do. Whether we make reservations or not, we always try to have a backup plan so that if we get somewhere and it's not what we expected, uh, we're ready to move on and go somewhere else. If you're watching this video, you may be new to camping. If you are new to camping, I highly recommend staying 
in a campground at least for your first few trips um, they're well worth the money for uh, bathrooms and the garbage service and you'll have uh, possibly a, a host at the campground that can help you out with questions or problems that you may have you know, at least the opportunity to socialize and um, learn things by seeing other setups and talking to other campers on the road it can be chaos trying to camp during the major holiday weekends um, so I highly recommend avoiding that and if you are restricted then maybe look at more remote more primitive uh, campgrounds generally speaking National Park Service campground or a state campground or a private campground there's a higher likelihood that you're going to have amenities like um, showers uh, possibly a laundry mat, uh, concessions, uh, firewood for sale, electrical hookups, forest service or BLM have a wide range of campgrounds from extremely primitive maybe picnic tables, a fire pit and an outhouse to more full service campgrounds but normally they will not have showers and very few will have electrical hookups. Most campsites within the campground will be able to accommodate a teardrop trailer. Um, they're small enough that they'll pretty much fit into any campsite. Although some campsites may be designated for hike-in only or no trailers, um, a tent site is typically just letting you know that there's a pad that will accommodate a tent. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to have a tent in order to occupy that site. Now there can be some odd rules in these different campgrounds, especially the more developed campgrounds. So when in doubt, um, go read the rules at the bulletin board or there's often someone at the entrance of the campground to answer questions or you can speak with a campground host. The best time of day to uh, find a vacant campsite is somewhere between 10 a.m. and about 3 p.m. Most people that are traveling, they want to get loaded up and hit the road by 10 a.m. and um, there's a checkout time where people actually need to vacate the campsite. 3 p.m. is a good time to try to get something if you're in a busy area because most people want to be set up by 6 p.m. for cooking dinner and also to set up in the daylight uh, so don't be one of those poor unfortunate souls that's out driving around at you know eight nine ten o'clock because the campgrounds are full and you keep driving from one place to another trying to find a site that leads us into the next type of camping which is dispersed camping and dispersed camping can be a great backup plan to uh, campgrounds that you get to and they're, they're full. Uh, typically the campground is going to be surrounded by public land. If that land is managed by the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, um, they typically allow camping uh, anywhere as long as you're not uh, blocking or restricting a road, a trail, a gate. Um, quite often you have to be a certain distance from a campground or a trailhead parking lot that's going to be posted but you can go off on the Forest Service and BLM roads find a nice wide spot quite often you know there's enough of that type of activity where there will be a little fire ring uh, you just pull in and set up your camp and it all works great some areas will have designated dispersed camping where there will actually be um, little campsites just sprinkled around and maybe there'll be a centralized um, outhouse or a water pump. Designated dispersed camping often has a picnic table or a fire ring and if it's during fire restriction season you may be allowed to make a campfire in a designated fireplace whereas if you uh, set up your own dispersed camp uh, you may not be allowed to make a campfire. So if you like to disperse camp in particular, it's a good idea to carry a uh, portable propane type fireplace. Not always. I mean, they can completely shut it down even to public entry if the fire danger is extreme enough. 
a good resource for looking into that is the internet. Go to the agency websites. You can often make a phone call to a local ranger station. True dispersed camping has no amenities. You just do it on your own. You pack it in, pack it out. You want to leave no trace. Uh, there's no garbage service. There's no running water. There may be natural water, uh, but you're on your own. So just be prepared if you plan on doing that type of camping that you're very familiar with the area or you have great maps and you understand that you are on your own. Uh, you want to make sure that you have an emergency first aid kit, things like a device to jumpstart your vehicle if your battery goes dead. You're going to have to be self-sufficient when you are dispersed camping. Now let's talk about routes. Most destinations are going to have more than one route. We often like to travel in some type of a loop. Um, we also like to take scenic routes. We avoid freeway travel and major highways. Uh, I would much rather spend um, eight hours driving through you know, gorgeous back roads in the countryside than six hours trying to get someplace fast at eight on the freeway. It's just not enjoyable to travel that way. That's my opinion. If you like to save time by getting on the freeway to get to a destination quicker, I understand that, especially if you have a very limited amount of time for your trips. But again, I think it's a good idea to consider. You take the back roads, you find cool little towns and places to stop for food, uh, little museums, local history, things like that. Um, some of our trips, that's what the whole trip is about. Um, some of these back roads are extremely back. I mean, there's, there's nothing out there. You, you want to make sure you are prepared and self-sufficient. A lot of areas have no cellular phone coverage and you may not see another vehicle or person all day. It's important to have things like traction boards, a winch, a shovel, a chainsaw, uh, this is where you're going to have to have some tools and some know-how in order to keep yourself out of trouble. One of the great things about towing a teardrop trailer is it can go anywhere. So if your tow vehicle can fit, most likely the trailer behind you is going to fit through the same terrain. Still, it's prudent to consider the types of hazards uh, in the type of terrain that you're going to be driving on. Your gas mileage can go way down. If you're in steep terrain, you may have to do some maintenance, letting your vehicle cool down, letting your brakes cool down. Your travel time can be extended. I'm sure you know there are a ton of resources for finding routes and locating places to camp. But let's take a look at some of the resources that we use. We have electronic resources. You have to be careful about what you're relying on. If your application requires a data or an internet connection, you may be out of luck. Our vehicle navigation system does not require an internet connection, so we can use that at anywhere. Uh, as long as we have uh, satellites to help locate the vehicle. This is what we use for our vehicle navigation. And we also have this on our phones. Another excellent navigation system, especially for pre-planning off-road routes, is Gaia GPS. There are a couple of features about Google Maps that we really like. Uh, when this is tethered through the phone and using data, we can see the gold stars, which are areas that we have visited, and the green flags are areas that we'd like to visit. So this is how I have our popular phone apps organized. And here's a brief look at the apps themselves. Free Roam is designed for finding campgrounds or uh, dispersed camp areas. So there's a dispersed camp, and here's a campground. It'll give us directions. This legend will tell you these have reviews and these do not. 
One of the things that we really like about Free Roam are the layers here. This one in particular will show us the Verizon coverage. So that's very handy. There's an overlay for Verizon. There's one for AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint. Another nice layer is the fire smoke. It appears the fire is probably in this area and the smoke is drifting to the northeast. Park Advisor is another handy resource. Home has some ratings and current conditions. Map is what we use most often. You can zoom in here. I currently have the legend set for uh, Forest Service, BLM, state campgrounds. I've excluded private campgrounds. You can see it has pretty good detail. There's one review with a few pictures. One of our favorites for dispersed camping is iOverlander. We'll click into the US. These are shared locations from users. The actual coordinates, which is great. You can put this into your uh, navigation system and uh, find your way there. Bring Fido is a good resource for dog owners. So for example, if we search for Yellowstone, we'll find Yellowstone National Park. It shows two and a half bones, which gives you an idea of how pet friendly this is. At this point, you can read the details about bringing a dog to Yellowstone. The most important resource for traveling, especially when we're away from civilization, are the paper maps. Now bear with me if you're from a different generation and you're not used to looking at paper maps. Electronics are great, but our most important resource for travel are paper maps. These paper maps are critical whenever you're traveling in an area that has a sketchy reception or really anywhere that you don't want to trust your safety um, on modern electronics. Now, we don't carry all these maps on every trip. This is just the collection, primarily forest service. Uh, there's some BLM. Each forest within the national forest system will have its own map, so they have good scale. Um, they're kept fairly current with uh, road closures, things like that. They're going to have uh, forest road numbers that your electronic maps may not have. They show uh, guard stations, trails, plus, you know, these work everywhere. We also carry um, state highway maps. The next type of map that I have here are site specific. We may want to return to a particular location and we will have a map for that. As you travel um, to destinations, you'll find that they have a visitor center or the communities will have a um, kiosk with maps and handouts. The next resource that we use are books. This is our uh, book collection for the state of Oregon. This is the state we live in. So naturally we have um, quite a few books about things to see and do in Oregon. So quite often, uh, these books have um, detailed maps. This one is uh, about mountain biking. These are great. And they also contain a lot of information besides just the map. Finding a new place to go visit, not necessarily bringing the book along. Now let's get a little more serious. If I could just have one map to bring along on a trip, it would be one of these atlas gazetteer style maps on the front page here we have basically it's an index also on the back which is very handy if you want to uh, travel or look at this area here you want page 80 there it is and this is the detail for that area of the state of Oregon. They have fantastic detail. Another neat thing about these is they will have information. For example, are the recreation areas that are listed or shown on the map. Let's use Mount Thielson Wilderness. That would be 
at page number 56 right here and grid number C2, 56 C2. So we go to page number 56 right here and where 2 comes down and C comes over, we should be at Mount Fielsen Wilderness. So there it is. So if somebody told you um, you really need to go see uh, Miller Lake in the Mount Fielsen Wilderness, um, you could quickly find it using this type of a map. Our campground, it will tell you how many campsites are there, if there's a boat launch, uh, fishing, hiking, that type of information is uh, in detail within this atlas. If you want to do some paddling, it will recommend areas and it will give you the coordinates to find that. This is also good for hunting because it breaks down the wildlife areas. Here's fishing. It has each of the lakes and bodies of water. But the greatest part you know, it's just the maps themselves. This has a second map of just the Crater Lake uh, National Park, for example. Um, so if you were going to Oregon and you had this type of a map, you would have all kinds of fantastic uh, resources at your fingertips. Um, no matter what kind of area you're going to visit, no matter if you have a cellular connection or your batteries are dead, um, you can still use these paper maps. The other thing that this type of a map gives you is a really good um, broad overview. Um, if you wanted to look from this corner to here, back over to there, uh, using a phone map, you know, you'd be scrolling and zooming in and out. And this, you can just see it all in one big piece. Another thing that we really like about these, we mark them up. Here's a place here that we just circled and wrote food. We know that we've stopped there, it had good food, and we actually made a note. It helps us to remember places that we've already visited. You'd think it wouldn't happen, but it has happened to us. You know, we've driven back into lakes, uh, you know, spent hours to get there. And then, uh, you know, another trip, we wound up hiking into the same lake from a different direction. And we got there and we realized, hey, you know, we've been here before and the fishing wasn't that good. I just like to make notes on these maps. It's also a very cool, um, almost like a journal. Let's look at the Utah Gazetteer. This one is just a little bit different style. This is an area that we visited along with the good folks at uh, Bean Trailer. We took a caravan type trip. One of the guys marked this for me to help guide us to an area to um, find another uh, campsite for the group. Um, so it just brings back, you know, cool memories and also um, helps us find these places again, uh, you know, years later. We can go back, open the atlas, and um, revisit some of these awesome spots. It's a great resource, and it's also a really fun thing to go back and look through. Lastly, for maps, I have these um, seven and a half minute quads. And these are um, extremely detailed. Each one of these two inch by two inch squares is a single section or a single square mile. If you want to find abandoned mines and you know homesteads, things like that. Now that we've looked at maps, let's look at how to do some um, navigating using a map along with a compass. If you have a map and you don't have a compass, you lose quite a bit of the function of the map itself. And we're going to get into that here in just a second. Let me start by saying a good compass isn't cheap, but a cheap compass is better than no compass. This is one that I keep on my fishing bag at all times. That's another thing is a compass is only good if you carry it. Quite often when I'm hiking away from camp, this bag is going with me. Even if I don't fish, um, I will carry things inside this bag and use it as a day pack. The next type of compass is one that you 
actually sight through so you see uh, the degrees and the the needle uh, points your route this is one that i've used in pretty intense compass situations it's something that you can just quickly bring up to your eye sight down it and keep moving this is probably not uh, the best choice the best choice for a hand compass using with a map in my opinion is going to be at least this style of compass uh, if not this exact compass this is a silva uh, ranger and they are at least through my career the standard for quality and features this is the compass that i used for decades and i don't think it's changed at all one of the features of this compass is that you can change the declination everywhere you travel has a little different uh, declination true north magnetic north there's slight variations in degrees here you can see that the arrow on the bezel here is not pointed due north it's off by about 19 degrees that's a correction for the way the earth's magnetic lines they don't fall due north and south on all parts of the globe the other thing that this type of compass has is a mirror which is really nice because you sight into the mirror you can see the the compass uh, face the bezel and the needle and you can sight over the top of the crosshair to line yourself up with a mountaintop or some other uh, feature you can line up with that and you can see the exact degrees uh, to that mark if you didn't have the sight and the mirror then you look down at the compass and then you look back along the edge and you use the edge of the compass uh, the same way the basic function of the compass is the same the needle just points north as long as you know that the needle is pointing north you know your basic directions north south east and west and then the bezel is marked in degrees let's look at a couple of real world situations where you would use the map combined with the compass the first thing you're going to want to do is orient the map the top of most all maps uh, is going to be north if the top of the map is not north there should be an indicator uh, letting you know that this is an unusual map and north is pointing some other direction we can use the compass to turn the map until the north is properly aligned and here we go of course we're inside of a trailer you want to be away from metal objects you see how I have the compass lined up on this crease it could also be lined up over here right on the edge of that side um, but we need to have it perfectly lined up with a north south line on the map so again top of the map is north and now the compass is not quite right or turn it and there it is now this map is properly uh, oriented okay here comes the rain okay so here we are at this campsite for example say I took off and I I drove and I got on these roads and I went off this direction and I wound up down here And now I want to uh, find my way back to this campsite. I would stand at this campground, I would orient the map, and then I would just follow that compass line north until I made my way back to camp. It doesn't have to be an absolute straight line. As long as your line continues to go north, you will find your campsite. Eventually, you would come to this freeway here, Interstate 70, 
And from Interstate 70, you would be able to find your track that you used in order to get back to the campsite. If you had no compass and you just had the map, you could turn the map in any which direction and you wouldn't know uh, which way is the campsite. Here's a good example of a real simple way to use the map and the compass. If we're camped here at Adele Campground on Miller Lake, and say we took off to go fishing, we walked up the road, we came up this creek here, and then we walked up this um, Howlett Creek, and the fishing was great, so we stayed on it for quite a while, and then it was time to return back to the campground. If we didn't want to do all this zigzagging, um, we could simply use the compass. The top of the map is north. We know that if we walk generally north, we're going to run into this road and run back into the lake. Without the compass, you could walk, you know, part way between the creek and the lake. You could get turned around, not know uh, which way, north, south, east, or west, and you could wind up walking the wrong direction and spending a lot of time. Another example would be um, sitting at camp and having this map along with a compass and knowing that if you walked due south, you would run into this creek. And uh, maybe the plan would be, let's walk from camp, we walk due south, we run into the creek, we'll walk up the creek and do some fishing, then walk back down this creek, do some more fishing. When we come to this creek junction, we'll know that we need to head generally north along it, and we'll come to the road and then find our way back to camp. In other words, we wouldn't have to carry this map with us. We would just get ourselves oriented while we're at camp, and that would give us enough information to use a compass to ensure that we don't get lost walking back to camp. I've been involved in a lot of search and rescues, and if a person would just have a compass and had a basic understanding of how they work, um, it could be a real lifesaver. Here's another example. Say you were out um, four-wheeling in this country on these uh, Jeep trails, uh, typically, your GPS would show that uh, you are here, you have a little uh, indicator, but without it, um, it could get real difficult. So say your electronics were knocked out on the way back, and you had to find your way back here to Mazama, um, you could use your compass and the map. You could be driving generally southeast, and you could correctly assume that you're on this stretch of the road and if you came to that intersection there seeing a road that goes nearly uh, due east and one that goes southeast now you know that you're at this location you would continue another uh, two or three miles and you would come to this road here using your compass to check the bearings on these roads would help guide you back along this route until you came to your destination of Mazama. With just the map and no compass, you wouldn't know which direction these roads were headed. This classic Silva Ranger compass comes with a really nice little guidebook on how to use a compass, and um, it's a really a nice thing to have along with you on trips. Whenever you set off on a hike or a drive, you should know the general direction of travel that you're taking. If you're just simply trying to find a line, a road, uh, you know that the road is due east. If you keep walking east, you're going to run into the road. That type of function is just basic and essential. Mm -hmm.